Good morning. And welcome to worship at the First Congregational Church of Woodstock, where whoever you are, wherever you find yourself on your life or spiritual journey, you are welcome and celebrated here. We are grateful for those who are joining us online this morning, as well as for all of our special guests. Today is a really exciting day. Um, it is Earth Day, and each year we pick a topic to focus on because we want to celebrate how does our faith and spirituality inform the ways that we are called to truly be stewards and caretakers of this great cathedral of God's creation. And so we are just so thrilled that everybody is with us today um, for this very, very special day. O oh God of justice and plenty, whose generous earth was created for its own peculiar beauty, for the nourishment of its people, and to sing of your glory, we confess that we have harvested injustice and pollution and not your abundance. We have uttered prayers of thanksgiving without true gratitude. We have failed to recognize the suffering of the earth and of the people who have produced our food. We have ignored our connection to the rest of your creation and moved further away from your vision of your beloved community. We turn to you, O oh God. Forgive us and transform us. Help us to give thanks, not just for our food, but for all those who have brought it before us. Encourage us to work for justice for all, so that all may give you thanks and be fed. Embolden us to adopt practices that heal the earth, regenerate the soil, and create a more sustainable world in the now of our action. In Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. My friends, hear the good news. In loving compassion, we are blessed and made whole by God. In loving compassion, we are nourished and fed by the Spirit of our Creator. In loving compassion, we are placed into relationship with all of creation, with God in God's self. And in loving compassion, we are forgiven, wrapped in the warm embrace of a gracious God as we seek to live in ways that reflect the network of our interconnectedness within ourselves, with others, and with the whole of creation. Creator God, you are an amazing God, and we give you thanks for this beautiful, wonderful day that you have made, and for this earth, and for the beauty and the mystery of all of your creation. We give you thanks that we are a part of this incredible creation that you have made, and that you are yet with us on this journey. We lift up the joys of friends returning, of um, the children who are going to be baptized, of learning new lessons about how we can truly live in to your call to be caretakers of this world. We come to you this day, though, with hearts that are heavy for those who are grieving and ill, those who are struggling with illnesses of the mind, the body, and the spirit, for the groaning of all of your creation and the ills that we have caused um, for your earth. We ask that you continue to inspire us and continue to guide us that we may use our presence and our wisdom and our technology for good to bring about peace among your people and healing for this great world. We ask all these things in your name, knowing that you work in us and through us and through all things for good. We know that you are the God of love, for you came to us in the one Jesus, your Son, who gave us this prayer that we now pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please join us in the spirit of prayer. Gracious God, source of all life, and Christ, you show the special role we have in bearing your likeness, and working 
and caring for the earth and seeking to understand her mysterious and powers and gently working with these powers for the well-being of all children of the earth. Open our hearts as we listen to deeply your word that your spirit may be lead us to sensitive closeness with you, the ground of our being and all of the earth's life. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 through 30, from the Inv Inclusive Bible. And God said, let us make man humankind in our image to be like us. Let them be stewards of the fish in the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, the wild animals, and everything that crawls on the ground. Humankind was created as God's reflection in the divine image God created them. Female and male, God made them. God blessed them and said, bear fruit, increase your numbers, fill the earth, and be responsible for it. Watch over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all the living things on the earth. Our second reading is from Paul's letter to Romans, chapter 8, verses 9 through 23. All creatures, all creation e equally awaits the revolution of the children of God. Creation was subject to futility, not of its own accord, but because of one who subject it in the hope that creation itself would be freed from its slavery to corruption and would come to share in the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that from the beginning until now, all of creation has been grown grown in, in one great act of given birth. May these words comfort, challenge, and inspire us to embrace the future with hope. As I said earlier, each year we pick a theme to focus on for our Earth Day worship service, and we participate in an organization called Interfaith Power and Light, um, and locally within Connecticut, their affiliate is um, the, the um, network for um, eco-justice. And, um, and through our relationships, um, the theme this year is common ground, and it is about our connection between the earth and our food and our faith. And how does that actually inform us to be good stewards? And what are the ways? And, and through some of, of the materials that we've been looking at and studying, we saw these practices about regenerative farming. And so I did what anybody does. It was a new term, and so I Googled it. And then I was just absolutely amazed to find out that just the next town over in Pomfret, there is a couple who moved from Philadelphia to Pomfret in order to begin practicing regenerative farming. And um, really excited, I reached out to Adam um, at Unbounded Glory Farm and um, asked and invited if he and Courtney would come and share a bit of their story and maybe inspire us um, a little bit with these regenerative practices. And so I would ask that you give a big welcome to Adam and Courtney as they share their story this morning. He likes to talk, so I'm just starting a timer so he doesn't talk too much. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having us. I'm Courtney, this is Adam, and uh, we're really excited to talk to you about our story and how we wound up being regenerative farmers uh, just next door in Pomfret. Um, so over a decade ago, Adam and I were both working for Whole Foods Market in Philadelphia. We were working eh, 80 to 100 hours a week. We had a tiny little garden. Uh, about an eighth of an acre, which was big for the city. Um, and we had every square inch maxed out. We could not plant a single, one more single plant in our yard. Um, so we loved gardening, and that's kind of how we started down this path. And through our work at Whole Foods, we actually became involved with a campaign to save the honeybees called Share the Buzz. It was a global campaign for the, the, the entire, all the stores in the world, and uh, we were already beekeepers at that point, but we, we went from about one or two hives in the city on our rooftop to three or four, and soon we had about 17 uh, spread uh, out. 
I don't do anything halfway. No. <laughs> and, um, and actually, we got to a point where uh, Adam was in charge of a campaign to put honey beehives on top of Whole Foods rooftops all around the country and creating um, a protocol for how stores could do that. And so we became very active in the honeybee side of things. And after a few years of our hives swarming in the city and neighbors not so much loving that aspect, even though they're very harmless when they're swarming, we kind of just looked at each other and said, we need more space. We need to get out of the city. And I'm originally from Brantford, uh, so about an hour and 20 minutes from here. And uh, we decided we were going to start looking up here. And so we started our search on goodoldrealtor.com. And um, we also found an organization called the Last Green Valley. And once we learned about what the Last Green Valley was, the 35 towns in the corridor, all dedicated to preserving natural resources, outdoor recreation, farming, agriculture, all of the good things that we were really excited about and kind of spoke to our values, we decided that this was where we were gonna make our home. And our search landed us in Pomfret. Um, so we picked up and moved. And we, actually when we moved here, uh, so we, we, we moved here about 11 years ago and we started the farm within a year, because it, it takes some time, um, obviously, to get things going. We thought we were gonna be organic farmers. Uh, through all of our work at Whole Foods, we were very, very familiar with organics and we thought that was the way that Mother Earth really needed um, to help heal the world. And so we started off on that path and little by little, we actually started getting hints of, hmm, this isn't adding up, this doesn't quite make sense. And you know, the, the organic movement, although it started many, many decades ago, became popular, popularized in the 80s and when the Organic Standards Board became a federal, federally, federal, regu federal regulations kind of moved in for organics. And that's when things were starting to change. As more big businesses got involved, the organic standards changed as well. Um, and so we kind of started realizing that some of the practices weren't adding up to what our vision was for a healthy planet and for healthy plants and for healthy food. And we were lucky enough to link up with some other local farmers who already had a lot of these regenerative practices under their belt. You know, 10 years ago, there was no Kiss the Ground movie. There wasn't much talk about regenerative agriculture. Um, and we were lucky enough to learn about some of these practices from some really great farmers in the area, uh, including Willow Valley Farm and uh, Tobacco Road Farm in Lebanon. And so that kind of started us down our path. Well, so we had moved up here and brought our honeybees. Uh, if you can visualize Adam driving in his Honda Civic with three beehives in the back seat, <laughs> tied together, and I believe a few bees got out while you were driving. Yeah. Doesn't make for a safe driving experience for six hours. So we learned the hard way about how not to move bees. Um, so when we started the farm, we had a lot of beehives and we kind of were going to continue down on that path. And over the years, we've actually changed a lot of our practices and perspective. And now as part of our regenerative practices, we focus a lot more on native pollinator habitat and native pollinator gardening. Um, and so that's something we weave into our practices that Adam can talk a little bit more about. Uh, how that fits into the whole scope of what we do now as regenerative farmers. She is, you have 10 minutes. yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> she's, she's, she's right. This is dangerous. I spend most of my time by myself um, and I don't get to talk a lot. So once I get started, it's hard to stop sometimes. Um, but I just want to offer a couple kind of religious reflections, since we are in a church, uh, to kind of punctuate uh, my message this morning. <laughs> and this is something that I don't think we often acknowledge, but every single one of us sitting here today, regardless of where you hail from originally on this planet, uh, where your ancestors are from, Every single one of us are descended from tribal peoples that practiced animism, which is 
the worship of nature, every single one of us. It's no accident that the name of the first man, the name that, that I proudly share, uh, comes from the Hebrew Adama, which means earth or soil. That's where we, we come from, right? Uh, it's also uh, interesting that the crucifixion, which is an ancient form of execution practiced by animistic peoples, one of the elements of it, what made it an ultimate indignity, was that the subject of the crucifixion was hung above the earth. And they were spiritually, physically, and metaphorically being divorced from the earth at their moment of execution, which was the ultimate indignity. Um, I grew up in the shadow of a church. My father's an Episcopal minister, and I got to hear him preach a lot, went to a lot of church when I was a kid. Um, and there's a sermon that has always stuck with me uh, where the subject was the difference between a vocation and a calling, and that anybody can have a vocation, you know. You, you, you go to work, you punch the clock, you punch in, you punch out, you go home, you forget about it, hopefully, you don't take it home with you, and uh, you can turn it on and you can turn it off. But a calling is something that is a, a blessing in this, in this life. And one of the hallmarks of it is there is no clock you can punch. It's an obsession. It's something you can't turn off even if you wanted to. And uh, we've both been very blessed in our lives to find a calling, or rather it found us. And uh, we've been blessed to be able to live that calling our entire lives, uh, adult lives. And that is, uh, at its core, the act of feeding people. And food is the true currency of life, right? Uh, and growing food with integrity, sowing seeds, uh, being the steward of uh, life processes that then can turn around and nourish members of our community and ourselves, we find that to be a sacred act. And within the backdrop of a food system which is pretty much entirely driven off of degradation and exploitation at almost every level, whether it's human exploitation, uh, in the labor that goes into it, or the environmental exploitation that occurs, and how we have been continuously degrading the resources required uh, to feed ourselves. Um, that growing food that honors natural systems and honors uh, what I call an eco-reality that surrounds us all uh, is in fact not just a sacred act, but it's a pretty radical act in this current time we live in. Um, so I think a lot of us are aware of where we are in this eco-reality right now. And that is we have ecosystems around the globe that are precipitously collapsing. And uh, there's a lot of ways we can measure that. I just, I just read an article in The Guardian this week about how uh, ecologists for decades now have been taking audio recordings of ecosystems. And uh, what they found over the decades is that those ecosystems are progressively going silent. And now they're referring to those old recordings that, that cataloged you know, more of an intact ecosystem and the biodiversity. They're, re they're referring to those recordings as acoustic fossils. Uh, we also have, you know, obviously rapid climate breakdown uh, occurring. 
Um, so that is the backdrop that we are growing food in. And it, if you don't think it's touching our little corner of the world up here, just try growing your mortgage payment in an open field and uh, you'll notice what's happening. You know, and we can look at what's happening right now with uh, just precipitation events. You know, I saw rain forecasts last summer that looked like snow forecasts. What do you mean three to six inches? You know, what about July where we got something like 20 plus inches in two, three weeks. Um, so that's the, the backdrop of our current eco-reality. And uh, where regenerative agriculture fits into that is it offers us a pathway back to a relationship with our environment and with that which sustains us uh, to begin again to understand the language that all of our ancestors could listen to and could speak. And that's the language of nature. If you go outside and you open your heart and you open your eyes and you open your ears, you will see that all around you there is a conversation happening. Most of us don't even know how to listen to that conversation anymore. Most of us don't know how to be a part of that conversation anymore. Uh, but there is an energetic flow through all things that I think we're all aware of. And there's something that I consider a exo-intelligence that flows through everything, including us. Um, and regenerative agriculture is a set of practices. It involves different things for different people, depending on the type of agriculture. But at its core, it's more than just practices, it's a, it's a mindset, it's a mentality and an orientation whereby conventional agriculture and even big industrial organic agriculture has a very militaristic approach to growing food. And that makes perfect sense because most of our chemicalized agriculture is evolved from the military industrial complex and we needed something to do with all that infrastructure once we stopped killing people with chemicals in World War I and World War II. Um, but regenerative agriculture seeks to join the conversation that's happening all around us in our natural environment. And to be symbionts with that natural environment. So we recognize that everything, whether it's convenient for us or not, for our economic goals <laughs> with growing food, uh, everything in nature has a purpose. There are no non-beneficial insects. Everything is food for something else. Everything is part of the same energetic flow. And so, in 10 years, we have not used an ounce of poison uh, on our ground. And we look at our farm as an ecosystem. And our job is to try to work in a way that enlivens that ecosystem and works with the dynamism of natural systems. And so, when you don't have the easy answers of poisons, you have to read the tea leaves. You have to learn the language that's being spoken all around you. And we don't look at any insect, as an example, as non-beneficial, because if I have a crop that I can't bring to market because it's being destroyed by insects, those insects are actually part of the system. And what those insects are telling me and what they're there to do is to perform an ecological service and to cull poor genetic expression out of the ecosystem. So unhealthy plants attract insects to cull their genetic expression from the ecosystem. That's the service that they provide. So, you know, 
we don't, our farm is not a magical place where everything goes our way all the time. Um, <laughs> uh, we learned pretty much all of our lessons the hard way. Um, and one of the things that inspired us down this path was as, as people that are passionate life learners, we uh, wanted something that would always provide an opportunity for, for learning and growing. And uh, we wanted something that would challenge us in every possible way imaginable spiritually, physically, emotionally, psychologically. And let me tell you, agriculture does not disappoint when it comes to that. Uh, but it also keeps you very humble um, because just the, the second you think you've, you've learned how to read the tea leaves, you've got it figured out, uh, that's when you're gonna get shown that you're, you're, uh, you're just learning the first syllables, really. Um, and this pathway back to that language, this pathway back to um, producing food in a way that uh, works with nature is not just about environmental health and an opportunity to uh, be better stewards of the earth, but it is also about human health and it's about community health. Because somewhere in the Hippocratic Oath it says, let thy food be thy medicine. And it turns out if you eat really healthy food from really healthy plants and animals, your food can be your medicine. And what the US government, and also the British government, has been documenting since uh, the 30s and 40s is a progressive uh, decline in the nutrient density of our raw fruits and vegetables. And if you chart it on a graph, you can see that this is the decline. Now, if you chart chronic degenerative disease, of which we have at epidemic proportions in the developed world, it goes like that, the next. And uh, we've all heard you are what you eat. That's 100% true. Um, so one of the things in our current moment where we are in this incredible cycle of uh, extinction and you read the news and None of it's terribly good. Um, you know, it can be, it can, you know, you can throw up your hands and say, well, you know, we're, we're, we're doomed. Uh, and uh, it's funny because, you know, in the 80s when I was like kind of like a, a little nature dweeb and I spent all my time outside and, you know, uh, I would read books about this, this theory of global warming. And then we went from that to the 90s and we're like, oh, it's, you know, it's probably happening. We think it's happening. Maybe it's happening. Uh, and then we went into the 2000s and we're like, well, yeah, sure. Yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty sure now. And we went from that to we're doomed, like really quick. Um, and, you know, one of the, the things that I think is, is core to facilitating action for every single one of us, and, and this is not talked about often in the media, but there's a good reason why the developed world in the United States has such a significant carbon footprint, such more significant than uh, the global south and the uh, developing world as we call it sometimes. And that's because our rate of consumption of everything is much higher. And that's kind of a component of uh, capitalism, is that we are actively encouraged to uh, participate in what I consider pathological consumption. We're just constantly buying things that we don't really always need. Um, and there's this idea that you know one day we're gonna have solar power and electric cars and we're all just gonna like, it's all gonna be sustainable. You know, and maybe AI, if it doesn't decide to kill us all, will, uh, will help us out of this global warming issue and this eco-collapse issue. Um, but what we really need to do is examine our relationship, 
each, each of our relationships with our environment and with the impact, the very real impact that we all have on that environment through this process of consumption. And it matters. Um, you know, it matters that people go out of their way to support local farms, whether they're conventional, organic, or regenerative. We need a return to vibrant local food systems, diverse local food systems, local food systems that also work in concert with ecology. Um, so I would encourage you all to meditate on consumption, your consumption, and the idea of enough, which I think we all need to figure out what that means to each and every one of us if we are going to find a way back to the language that we all used to speak but that we have lost. <clears throat> I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And He walks with me talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the voice we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy Your gifts, whether they are of song or of prayer, of presence, the ways that you volunteer your time to work in ministries, it is part of what makes this church work and come together. And so we're going to sing the doxology in a moment. Um, you'll find that there are offering plates at either of the two entrances. Um, they are there. If you do have gifts that you would like to give, you can, you can put them there. If you're following us online, you can give at firstchurchwoodstock.org. Um, and... Um, you can also mail your gifts to P.O. Box 147, Woodstock, Connecticut. Um, but before we sing the doxology, Donna has a poem for Earth Day that she would like to share. And uh, when she is done, then we'll go into the doxology. When there were trees, we would scurry out of the verdant green like tiny denim insects toward the light of home, our hair scented with fern, our secrets held and held close. 
while our mothers called us from their pea-shucking porches and our hearts sang the dark, rich tones of the earth. When there were bees, we spun from flower to flower, drawn into the dizzifying dance, our knees stained in emerald green and our noses gold with pollen. We crawled into their secret places, hoping to pet their fuzzy bottoms, confused by their reluctant stings, wishing they were fairy children instead, while we supped upon waxen cones dripping with honey and our dreams trickling down our chins. Oh, but that was when there were bees. When the earth was fecund, we captured fireflies in jars at dusk and set them on our windowsills at night, cracking the code of their flickering green light only to glimpse our future selves. And who knew that we would choose complacency and greed, turning away as if nothing were wrong in the meadow at our doorstep when the flickering lights waned from the thousands to the hundreds? then two, then one, leaving us sad and empty and longing for the time when we danced with the bees, when we dreamed of polar bears, when we breathed the sky from a chalice of blue, when there were trees. And in one voice, let us offer our prayer of dedication. Blessed are you, God of the universe. You are the giver of all good gifts, the fruit of the earth and product of our labors. We humbly and hopefully pray that you may bless these gifts that we dedicate in service of your vision in Christ's ministry in the world today. May they be like seeds planted in fertile soil, growing to fullness, bearing much fruit, nourishing hope, love, and justice in our relationships, community, and your world. My friends, our closing words come from Julian of Norwich, who was a mystic many, many hundreds of years ago. As we head out, and prepare to go into the world to be the church. May these words ring true in whatever way they make sense to you. Be a gardener. Dig a ditch, toil, and sweat. Turn the earth upside down. Seek the, deep, uh, seek the deepness and water the plants need in time. Continue this labor and make sweet floods to run and noble and abundant fruits to spring. Take this food and drink and carry it to God as your true worship. May we find ways to make it so this week and in the months and the years to come that we may truly be the church.